And now we have uh, Megan, who will be telling us about lymphoma tumor microenvironments. Hello, um, my name is Megan. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa. And today I'm gonna talk to you about how I use Julia with my math models of cancer. Uh, so one type of cancer that I study is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is the fifth leading cause of cancer-related death uh, in the US. So this is um, cancer of your lymph system, including your lymph nodes, things like your tonsils. Um, but the subset I really focus on is uh, Burkitt lymphoma, which is the fastest growing uh, tumor. Uh, it has an activated oncogene and it can, um, it has a really high doubling time every 24 to 48 hours. Um, so the hypothesis that we have is that this uh, really quick doubling time has to do with uh, recruitment of cells that are already um, in uh, where your, where your uh, tumor is, so recruitment of fibroblasts and macrophages, which allow um, the cancer to grow so quickly. And so um, with some data from our collaborators, um, Dr. Schmidt, uh, they set up an in vivo or an in vitro system where they have um, cold cultured uh, fibroblasts, macrophages, and lymphoma. Um, and created a very large data set for us. So um, they tried different uh, initial conditions of each of these three different cell types and it was all in triplicate. And so this is kind of to give you an idea of what kind of data we're using from the biology side and how we can use uh, Julia. Um, so step one is build your mathematical model. Um, so write down some ODEs. Uh, so it doesn't really matter what your ODEs, this is just kind of a simple system that I set up. Um, but that step was done pretty easily. And we saw a talk earlier about how you can take just um, the standard reactions and convert them to an ODE, which would also work. Um, but the next step was really to implement this in Julia. So differential equations.jl has been super helpful with uh, this process. And so um, uh, since I have really focused on looking at these math equations, um, I was really pleased to see with differential equations.jl, um, these look pretty similar. So you can see here, um, you can define your three differential equations and the rates match directly uh, with the equations that I set up. And so uh, to really set up this uh, differential equation model in Julia is pretty easily. Um, you can create this function which has your equations. Uh, then you define what your initial conditions are, what your initial parameters and things like that are. Um, and then in two lines of code, you set up your problem and you can solve it. And so um, the next thing is to do is plot it. Did it actually give me something reasonable? And so we see it did, yay. Uh, we see the green line is the lymphoma and that's growing, which isn't great, but that is what happens experimentally. Um, so that's good. Uh, but I talked about this really big data set that I have. And so um, we have, you know, two to three different uh, initial concentrations of each of these cell types and all of this in triplicate. So uh, doing that individually would be a lot of work. Um, and so the Monte Carlo uh, problem definition came in handy here. Uh, so uh, again, here's the way that I could just input the data into Julia. Um, this is kind of how it's structured. Um, this is a picture from Excel, so I'm sure that makes everyone cringe. Uh, but the first three columns are what my initial conditions are, and then the time course are the following columns. And so Julie can read that pretty easy. Um, so uh, it's 141 different experiments, which are uh, 47 combinations um, that I had described earlier. And so uh, I can read that into Julia and then use that to create um, um, and a, a matrix that has just my initial conditions in it. And then again, in two lines of code, I can take that problem I had previously defined, uh, create it into this Monte Carlo problem, which has all of the initial conditions um, from the experimental data we had. And then again, just this quick solve and it will uh, create my problem. And so uh, it looks really ugly because it's a lot of lines. And so you don't actually want to look at it. Um, but that was just all getting the model system set up. So that was a, it's a nice structure, but what we care about are what are the different uh, rates and what, would, uh, what are the rates that have actual biological meaning. So the next step is parameter estimation. Um, and so again, if we look at my model, um, it has you know, six birth death rates 
And then this interaction matrix, which are nine more parameters, so 15 parameters total. Um, but what we learn in mathematical modeling is that just because it can have a parameter doesn't mean that that's actually true. And so uh, the next question is really, can we identify uh, a way, or can, what ways can we use to identify which parameters uh, are unnecessarily or not biologically true? And so um, to do this, I also use Julia. <laughs> Um, so I use L1 loss regularization, uh, which can be found in the machine learning package in combination with the optimization.jl. Um, and um, the way this works is first I create a loss function. So I just um, created a function that calculated the difference between uh, the data and what my model gave given a set of parameters. Uh, then I can, penal uh, I can create a penalty function, which I'll talk more about in a minute. And I can do this iteratively to identify a structure that I feel confident is uh, recapitulates the biology. And so L1 loss regularization basically takes um, your regular loss function, which here was just the sum of the squared errors, um, and adds a, a lambda times um, some kind of penalty function, which here was just the sum of the parameter values. Uh, so this uh, penalizes non-zero parameters, and so it identifies which ones um, I can remove from that model structure. And implementing in Julia was super easy. I didn't even have to modify my uh, cost function. I could create it. Uh, I could use my uh, least squares minimization um, function and then just tell it I want to do L1 loss. Um, using this, these few lines of code down here, just this regularization function, and then I recreate this uh, loss objective, and then I can plug it into the optimized uh, function through optim.jl, and it would give me um, the, uh, what parameters optimized uh, based on the data. Um, but you can pick whatever lambda value you want, and so how do would I figure out what would be kind of meaningful for that? And so uh, what we noticed is that when lambda, is, um, as lambda increased, more of the parameters were identified that they should go to zero. And so um, I actually used the AIC criterion, which um, is a metric that um, has a penalty for the number of parameters in the model, but also uses uh, just the residual error. And um, I could use that to compare how um, the number of parameters that were set to zero and this AIC score to identify a good structure moving forward. And so uh, this is kind of what the plot looks like of lambda versus the AIC score. Um, and we see that as we <coughs> decrease our lambda value, we were getting um, a smaller AIC score. So more, um, so the addition, the parameters in those systems um, and these bottom here model structures were all uh, good structures that had a similar error. Um, and so I could uh, estimate parameters in those to identify which model structure best describes three, three cells interacting. And so this is kind of a schematic um, of these three different cell types interacting. And then after I did my regularization, it was really only one parameter was really identified, which is slightly disappointing, but this one makes sense. Um, our collaborator also provided us data with a couple um, other cell types in these triplet combinations that had, um, that were inactive macrophages and fibroblasts. Um, and in those cases, we identified more as um, parameters that we could eliminate from our structure. Uh, but what was really exciting is that all these parameters that it were identifying made biological sense. So when um, two lymphoma cells came together, there wasn't a negative event. That makes sense. It's a lymphoma. It's carrying on, you wouldn't expect there um, to be any negative interaction. And so um, the kind of final step in my pipeline is now doing the actual parameter estimation after we have figured out, okay, this model structure is what we want um, and what we believe reflects biology. And so um, what I did is kind of a bootstrapping kind of thing where I subsampled the data and then I estimated the parameters and I iteratively did this with different subsets of the data and found the median parameters to be my true model parameters. And so um, this is kind of uh, the interaction matrix after the, um, after 100 runs of that. And the best test of all is when you plot it against the data and it looks really good, I think, because um, this is this one set of parameters describing all of these 
um, 47 different, uh, well, 141 different experimental conditions. And so um, just to kind of summarize it all, um, I've been really exciting learning Julia and being able to use all of these different tools from the differential equations um, package to some machine learning um, and just optimization. And Julia allowed me to easily implement this kind of pipeline that seems super complicated as I was stepping through it the last 10 minutes. But um, I really like that I could be at the cutting edge of all the new packages that and new algorithms that are coming out of Julia and I apply them to research and they seem to do a good job. Um, and they're super fast. <laughs> Thanks. Any questions? All right, are there any questions? In front of you. <laughs> uh, so, um, it seems that you managed to create a model ver that fits the data very well. Uh, just interesting, uh, now that you have the model, what is your next step to actually apply it to the reality? Yeah, so our next step is um, we're working with our collaborator to um, kind of identify different combinations um, that could be advantageous or prevent lymphoma growth. And so um, from there on, it's like, making predictions, having them test them, things like that. Yeah, and thank you for your fantastic talk. This is a demonstration of what a lot of people have been working on over the last few years. You know, you, you've definitely shown a lot of uh, what a lot of the GSOC projects for different DiffEQ have actually put together. Um, and I was kind of wondering, uh, did, you, did you end up looking at any uh, global optimization and see if that gave uh, different results which might have been better or did you stick to local optimization uh, for this? Um, yeah, so I tried a variety of different, um, different optimization methods. So I couldn't even tell you which one I landed on as the one that's the best. Because um, there were a few, some worked better for some situations than others. Um, but yes, I've tried a lot and I'm really actually excited about the um, Bayesian um, parameter estimation. I went to that talk yesterday. I think that would be really cool um, and so I want to try to implement that in the pipeline um, coming up. So, yeah. Thank you very much.